Jones looked back as the horses started down the final stretch. Then he focused on Bucky, still running in circles with his ticket held high around the oblivious Larkin flow. Hey Jonesy, you saw the race. Did Shorty push that horse? I don't think he did. Neither do I. He looked up at the Fletcher box. I wonder if the old man slipped a few bucks to him. Hamilton likes to win. Right, but that bag of bones jingle bells winning the ocean? Give me a break. Somebody made Mueller on this race. Yeah, Lark, said Jones, pointing. Bucky jumped up and down like a monkey as he led Lark with Flo on his elbow across the lower area. Lark stared at his ticket as he shuffled. Who owns Jingle Bells? asked Jones. Coco's face tightened. Oh, some Nimrod from Newtown. Not a player. The jockey is some kid from Vermont. It ain't so much that Jingle Bells won Jonesy, but how the rest of those horses didn't win. I think you're right. The Matthias Jones series is murder mystery but also tongue-in-cheek. The Handyman's Secret begins at the Ocean Stakes, a horse race run annually at the Frothingham Park. Matthias Jones meets his friend Coco Stefani outside in the stalls before the race. Up ahead, the bumbling security cop Bucky Driscoll is up near the stall housing Coco's horse, Vinny. Hamilton Fletcher, patriarch of the town, has a horse in the race. Bucky, up ahead, is actually talking to Vinny. He wants the horse to count to five. Coco quickly moves along the stalls and up to Bucky. He lifts him up with. He asks Bucky where is Webster Howard, the man who is supposed to be grooming the horse. Bucky says that Webster's stomach is sick. And then he tries to convince Jones and Coco that Arnie Dewar's owner of Dewar's Lumber, actually heard a horse talk at Hamilton Fletcher's stalls across from the Fletcher estate last Christmas. Coco tells Jones he doesn't want to lose this race because Bucky Driscoll pulled one of his stunts. A young woman in her 20s with pinned up hair, black painted nails and a beauty mark on her face, makes an appearance at the stall. Her name is Janet Boudreau, but she calls herself JB. Coco is immediately smitten with her. She boards her horse at the Fletcher stable, across from the estate. She competes in dressage and jumping events. Jones's predecessor, the effervescent but quite incompetent Locke Larson, approaches with his girlfriend Flo down to the stall. In the meantime, Coco is inviting JB to his club, Club Max in Prince William. Locke is pestering Coco as he's talking to JB about who he should bet on in the race. Coco tells Locke to bet on Jingle Bells. After Locke leaves, Jones questions the bet. Coco laughs and said, that horse is 30 to 1, he'll never win. Hamilton Fletcher is in the gallery in a white suit and brown linen tie. He sits with his son Ham and his wife. Coco says that Hamilton's jockey will do what it takes to win. Strangely seated in the Fletcher Gallery is Reverend Bricker from the First Parish Church in Hamilton. Jones moves down from the Fletcher box to Coco, who's down along the fence. At that time, he bets Jones $50 that he can get JB to come over to his club. Jones shakes his head and just wonders what the Reverend is doing at the racetrack. Coco makes it a point that Father Gallagher comes over the track and the problem with him is he never wins. Also along the fence is a state trooper, the 6'6", six six, Trooper O'Connell. As the race commences and the horses move down the stretch, Bucky is screaming for Jingle Bells. Jingle Bells is ahead of the whole pack. Jones can't believe it. As all the excitement is going on, the Reverend just reads a small book up in the stands. Coco suspects that his jockey may have been paid off. Later, Locke arrives at the winnings counter. He's escorted by Trooper Pinky Harris from the state police. Locke had put his lottery ticket, 1500 bucks, down on Jingle Bells, and now is cashing in on the windfall. Jones is a coach at Hamilton College. A few days later, he's out with his baseball team as they play Danbury College. He receives a call to go to Hamilton Fletcher's office right after the game. Hamilton already has a list of replacements for his jockey who blew the race. 
to his right, he sees Webster Howard, a local handyman who works for the Fletchers, is at Fletcher Hill. He speaks with Hamilton Fletcher, and Hamilton Fletcher gives him extra money to get a job done, and says, never turn down cash, son. Webster says that it was coffee in his thermos that gave him a bad stomach at the track. Jones wants to know why Bricker was at the track. Maybe because he was Hamilton Fletcher's pastor at First Parish Church. The bumbling Bucky Driscoll calls Hamilton Fletcher on his office phone. He speaks about a UFO that was hovering over Fletcher Hill. Hamilton Fletcher gets livid and hangs up the phone on Driscoll. As the game begins, his assistant coach, Woozy, says to put in Joe Saboter as ace pitcher. Franny McShane, one of the local waitresses who always liked Jones, makes it a point to tell Jones to watch out for Joe's arm. Sabota comes in and shuts him down on one pitch. Over at the end of the bleaches, Coco smoked a cigarette. Webster had left the game early, still not feeling well. Coco says that somebody had spiked Vinny's water before the race. They speak about Webster. In addition to being a handyman, he took his boat out into deep sea to look for tuna. Jones mentions a nor'easter that's coming up the coast. JB had called Coco. Coco says, I fell for her the minute she walked up to Vinny. Tom McGill, Captain Kendall, and Jones are watching from the docks as Lark, in his new speedboat, jets around the harbor. Lark said he knew about boats, but Jones tells the captain Lark says a lot of things. Unfortunately, he's going in circles around the bay and is on a collision course with a single boat in the harbor. Nobody's on the deck of the boat. Lark's wheel spins, smacking his skull. He can't find the radio and the instruction book blows overboard. Jones looks across the bay and says how the storm went out to sea. His friend Tom McGill, who owns the local paper, scans the water with his field glasses. A woman in a white off-road vehicle stares across the bay from the bridge. Locke's cruiser is heading directly toward the other boat. The captain looks through the binoculars and says that's Webster Howard's boat. He's supposed to be deep sea fishing for tuna. Lark and Flo hear the boat crunch and crackling wood. He has scraped the bottom of the deck of the maintenance-free Webster's boat. Stairs lead below the maintenance-free. We're dealing with a runaway boat, Lark tells her. As he moves down the stairs, he sees that Webster is dead. Jones is shaking his head at the dock. How do you crash into the only boat in the bay? Jones later takes his boat out with Tom McGill and steps onto the maintenance-free. Webster's body is 10 feet from the cabinet. On the table is a napkin with purple letters, RL. Dried blood is on Webster's shirt and jeans. Later, Police Chief George Strickland is down at the docks. He's looking for Trooper Pinky Harris, who is supposed to be there also. Strickland's goofy deputy, Wendell, says Locke is hysterical inside the captain's house. He's got the heebie-jeebies. There's a billowing cloud on the horizon, the nor'easter if it had swung this way, would have taken the maintenance free out to sea. In Jones' next game, he's in second place now, after losing to Groton. Webster used to sit in the bleachers, but now he's dead. Webster Howard's autopsy is completed by somebody named Stubble. Clayton Morris is out of town. Webster was murdered somewhere else and brought aboard the boat. But Lark is convinced that he's going to jail. Webster was supposed to be out fishing for tuna. No one seems to understand what the R.L. napkin means. Leo Crowley, manager for Jones' teams at the college, heads toward Jones. Jones tells him that Howard's wife, Mabel, never heard of R slash L. What's really strange is Trooper O'Connell, who was at the racetrack, is no longer at the barracks and nobody can find him. As the Dewar's lumber truck chugs at the corner, Jones goes into hiding near the bleaches with Leo and crouches down. He tells Leo that Webster was hit hard from behind. Someone let the boat drift. It was supposed to be taken out to sea. At that time, he finds that Lark has hired an investigator to do work to find the answers in Webster's murder for gratis. Father Gallagher, whose parish is in Prince William, in the city next to Hamilton, Prince William, doesn't like the fact that Bricker refuses to let him build a chapel on first parish land that was for sale just a few months before. Bricker wants to build a youth camp on that very site. Lark's long car slides within inches of Leo's truck along the stadium. Lark steps out in an orange blazer. Some other guy with pinpoint brown eyes moves along the bleaches, smiling profusely. His name is Clyde Hooper. He shows Jones his identification papers, which promptly blow all over the field. 
Hooper ends up climbing a tree to get one of the papers and is hanging upside down on a maple branch. He tells Jones that he's been hired by Locke on the ball peen rating system, the BRS. Jones just shakes his head as the phone rings. It's Bucky Driscoll. He shuts off the phone. Hooper leaps down from the maple branch, kicking Jones in the abdomen. Jones' stomach is still bothering him later when he walks into the colonial house and Franny serves him his meal. Franny says, your boys are tired, coach. You're pushing them too hard. When Jones leaves, he brings his jeep down toward the ocean, past the flashing yellow light on Shore Road. But the verbose Hooper is still in his mind. Boats are in the harbor in the afternoon sun. Jones is confused to why there was a woman on the bridge next to an SUV, and he wants to know why Trooper Bannister O'Connell is missing. Strickland tells him that O'Connell had taken everything from the crime scene out to a state police lab. Strickland then calls O'Connell a Neanderthal. Jones notices something that no one else has seen, a small red scrape on the hull of the maintenance freight. Who would want to kill Webster Howard? Jones finds out later that he had an argument with his wife Mabel on the dock before he went out to sea. Jones has a poignant question. Was the boat's gas tank filled or empty? The captain tells him that Webster did fill the tank the night that he went out, but it's now half empty. Webster usually went out, according to the captain, on Wednesday morning and came back Thursday night. He didn't say why he had gone out early on a Monday night. He was definitely in a hurry after the argument with his wife on the dock. The obnoxious trooper Pinky Harris, uncle of Strickland's assistant Wendell, exits his SUV. He said he talked with Mabel Howard. Pinky tells his boss, Captain Moxie, that he's talked with Mabel Howard. And this is an open and shut case. He then threatens Jones with spending a night at the state police barracks. Next morning, Jones calls Coco, waking him up. Coco says he didn't kill Webster, had nothing to do with the horse or anything else. Jones goes down to the Colonial House for breakfast. Father Gallagher is there with Leo Crowley's wife. At that time, Hooper, Clyde Hooper, shows up at the Colonial House and says, this is the man I want to see, and starts calling Jones MJ. He can hear Gallagher's booming voice as he walks along the booths. He learns that Mabel Howard is in a state of shock. According to Joanne, Hooper moves up front. Jones wants to know why did Webster leave on Monday? And what about the woman on the bluff? Hooper all of a sudden disappears. Joanne says that Webster was an experienced fisherman. He must have had access to a weather forecast. Jones thinks up one of his famous side road theories. The killer could have let the boat float into the storm. With no blood on the boat, Webster could have been washed overboard. Perhaps he tried to get to the radio. Reverend Bricker walks in, immediately sending Gallagher into a tizzy. Gallagher stands and walks over, determined to confront him about the land that Bricker would not sell to the church in Prince William. They have the same argument they had before. Franny says to Jones, if they fight, I bet three to one on Gallagher. There's another phone call. Bucky Driscoll is now investigating Webster's murder with Clyde Hooper. Hooper wants to meet. Jones says he's not meeting with him in an hour or ten days from now. Never. Lark Larson and his thin little toothpick girlfriend walk into the Colonial House. Lark begins one of his odd theories about a passing trawler luring in Webster Howard and Canadian fishermen taking revenge on him for fishing out the bank. Then he starts talking back in time as he always reminisces about the 1941 double draw in Hamilton football. Jones quickly leaves the restaurant and heads through the campus into town. Bricker's attitude had upset Gallagher. Up ahead, Clyde Hooper is standing in the middle of the road. He confronts Hooper, who quickly corrects him, saying he's Detective Hooper. Tells Jones he has special information that Howard's wife was spending beyond her means. Bricker's PT Cruiser zooms by. Hooper says that Bricker is very shifty. Jones drives in to Pudgy Wilson's gas station. Bricker is at the pumps. Hooper is suddenly there. He finds out that Hooper did detective work for Lark when Lark was a coach. Bricker says that Gallagher must have sent him over to the gas station to bother him. And then he tells Pudgy, put the gas on the church's tab. Pudgy said that the tab is already filled, but Bricker drives away anyways. Pudgy calls him a dipstick. Hooper is also gone, but as Jones drives away, there's a plastic playback toy on his visor, telling Jones that he's hot on the trail of Webster Howard's murderer. 
Bricker would not even sell the land, even though the land was up for sale six months earlier, and that bothers Jones. Thinks about the napkin R.L. and how Hooper was right. Pinky Harris had all the evidence now at the lab. Why did Webster head to see earlier in the week? On the common, he meets Franny. They look to their right as Bricker is in L.G. Bentley's law office. Bricker hurls papers onto L.G.'s desk and leaves. L.G. pounds his fist on the desk. The Reverend hops in his car and races around the common. L.G. is then on the phone back in his office. Tom McGill can't find anything up and down the coast about a restaurant or a lounge called R slash L. Jones holding a Big Mama's coffee in his hand. Here's a story about how Bucky Driscoll was harassing the captain down at Hanson's Marina in the morning. And the captain actually shot out a harpoon at Bucky. Hooper was underwater. Some special ops. He leaves a voicemail for Mabel Howard as Coco calls. He says that JB did come over to the club, but he's convinced that somebody slipped something into Vinnie's water. Because of Webster being sick at the track, Jones wonders whether she's involved in Webster Howard's murder. Coco says she's goody two-shoes. She was at the bridge, but she wouldn't have killed Webster Howard. Bucky was used by somebody else. According to Strickland, Pinky hasn't even investigated the red scrape on Webster Howard's boat. Jones gets samples that he's going to take to the Fletcher Paint Company. Wendell then talks about somebody up at the Fletcher stables called Misty, whom he seems infatuated with. Misty told Wendell that JB competes and does volunteer work. She's from Vermont. Her father and brothers are lawyers. And then he says that her dog was poisoned. But he's worried more about whether that boat would have gone down in the Nor'easter. Then he repeats his, then he repeats his late father's often used phrase, the obvious is the obvious. Somebody must own a red bottom boat. Hooper is up by the inn, across the common, photographing them. How did Webster get down here to the boat five miles while leaving his truck in his driveway? He's speaking with Nigel Kent, the college president. Nigel is pestering him about a video for the annual send-off for the summer at Fletcher Hill. Bricker will say an invocation at that ceremony, and he asks Jones to put the Fletcher spin on the video. Jones has a minor in communication and is working with students to produce the video. Back in his office, with Lark's old chair creaking and almost falling over, Hooper shows up. Captain said that the tank was half empty. That would leave a radius of about 250 miles. He calls up Clayton Morris, now back in town. Death was between 3 and 4 a.m. He had chicken marcella in his stomach. Also present in Webster's body was an infection in his throat and stomach. The body had definitely been moved, dragged. He had crawled below to get to the radio, but he didn't make it. According to the captain, the boats may have been taken along the lateral currents along the coast. Hooper is sitting on Jones's desk, annoying him. Bucky is on his walkie-talkie. He's at the marina and has the code name Walter, and Hooper is known as M5. Jones brushes aside a theory by Lark Larson that Webster committed suicide. Strickland shows up. He's looking for a woman at the stables. He's telling him now, according to Hooper, the wife Mabel was a cheater. O'Connell and Mabel are both missing. O'Connell could be the killer. Jones shakes his head as he moves past the land that Father Gallagher wants to purchase for the small chapel. Neither he or Bricker will back down. He drives to the Miller farmhouse in back of Webster Howard's home on Washington Street. Webster's house, strangely, for a handyman, needed repair. Smoke rose from a stovepipe out back in a shack. There's a Mercedes in the driveway and a blue pickup truck. When he knocks at the door, Mabel Howard, a woman with heavy perfume, large teeth and lots of makeup, thought Jones was Clyde, Clyde Hooper, which annoys Jones even more. She has layers of lipstick and puts a piece of chewing gum in her mouth and then lights a cigarette. She says that Webster was very busy before he left. He'd spent time in his shack and his garden. He did his thing and I did mine. Jones leaves the Howard house. He doesn't have much information, but a device on the porch indicated that Hooper was listening in. George Strickland warns him that he needs a search warrant. Hooper breaks into the shack. Inside is a multi-band radio, indicating that something else brought him out to the sea. All the days are crossed off on the calendar, even the days after Webster had died. It was as if he were planning to go out to sea on his usual run. Mabel was now a suspect. She had too much money and too much ambition. 
And then Hooper tells him to close his eyes for 30 seconds while he leaves. He leaps out the window and disappears into the woods. At one of Big Mama's coffee shops in Prince William, Strickland and Captain Moxie wait in the cruiser for Jones. Jones brings in donuts and coffee. Then he dials Coco. He wants to know if JB tried to poison Webster. Coco hangs up on him. Mabel has money and she shouldn't have it. He has to find out if Hooper is for real. He asks Captain Moxie to do a background check on Hooper. On Saturday morning, Lark, holding a clipboard, sits atop a horse up at the Fletcher stables. On the clipboard are sheets of paper with all of Hooper's notes. Flo is waiting for a horse ride. Holding the clipboard, Lark is almost thrown from the horse as Flo berates him for holding the clipboard and trying to ride the horse at the same time. He's reading the yellow line pages of Hooper's notes, but not holding on to the saddle. He slides off the horse, down the back of the horse, hitting the ground and the wind is knocked out of him. Lark starts bellowing about past football games at Hamilton College. His glasses are off and Misty McAmey leans over to help him to his feet. Flo invites her to dinner at the Colonial House because she helped Lark steady himself. Lark says he refuses to go until he finds out he doesn't have to pay. Bucky, meanwhile, is on surveillance on a walkie-talkie and has a digital camera draped around his neck. When Jones sees this, he runs toward the street away from his practice and finds Hooper in a truck sitting surveilling the practice. He throws Hooper off campus. At the same time, Bucky's voice echoes on the walkie-talkie as he calls Hooper M5 in code words. Jones immediately yells at Bucky through Hooper's walkie-talkie and Bucky says, I'm not here. I don't recognize your authority. Jones threatens to call Police Chief George Strickland as Bucky runs down the sidewalk. Jones is pondering what happened to Webster Howard. Was he poisoned? He may have been dehydrated. There was a thermos given to him at the track, and Webster got sick right after that. He calls Clayton Morris, the coroner, he wants a call from Strickland. Tom McGill shows up at the baseball game. Again, Hooper starts circling the field in his battered truck. Joe Sabota steps up to the plate and hits a long home run. Hooper is driving backward up the street along the fence. Jones and McGill head to Hooper's truck after the game. Sitting in Hooper's truck are Locke and Flo, and Hooper says he has a break in the case. At that time, Locke tells Jones he was thrown from the horse, and Hooper says he's located a mystery woman, yet he doesn't know who it is. He also says he's identified the woman who was at the bridge overlooking the accident with Lark's boat, yet he doesn't know her name. Lark mentioned he and Flo had dinner with Misty, and they mentioned how Janet Boudreaux's dog was poisoned and Webster got blamed. Suddenly, Jones sees he has a motive. Jones calls Coco. He's convinced that Coco is hiding something. He asked Coco if JB told him that her dog was poisoned. Webster being sick at the track was because of poisoning. Coco hangs up on him. The same person who poisoned the dog probably poisoned Webster. Jones tells his theory to George Strickland. Strickland tells him that O'Connell, the state trooper, has run off with the murdered man's wife, Mabel Howard. Jones complains about the autopsy. He finds out that Everett Stubble, the man who did the autopsy, is Herbert Lane, the district attorney's nephew. Mabel Howard is still missing. Strickland finds out that O'Connell lived in the same town, Millbury, as Mabel's sister. Jones goes up to the Fletcher stables where he meets Lark and Flo. Misty McAmey is giving lessons. At the same time, Hooper has positioned himself in an upper stable loft. There are binoculars around his neck. Jones is getting more and more aggravated by Hooper. He talks to Clayton Morris, the coroner, who tells him they've found sodium hydroxide didn't take that much in Webster Howard's body. Somehow it could have been diluted. Sodium hydroxide is found in common cleaners. Jones then talks to Misty when she finishes her lesson. She said that Janet Boudreaux blamed Webster for poisoning her dog and screamed at her. Webster told her directly he'd never do anything like poison her dog at the stables. Misty brings them down to a stall at the end of the stables where a carbine industrial cleaner containing sodium hydroxide is stacked on the shelf. Webster had drunk from a thermos that JB had given him. Jones thinks that Janet Boudreaux poisoned Webster. How could Janet Boudreaux have dragged Webster onto the maintenance free if she was on the bridge overlooking the accident? Jones travels behind Webster Howard's house to the neighbor, Harvey Miller. He leaves a message to Coco about the sodium hydroxide. 
In Webster's truck, he finds smooth-release stomach tablets and a receipt for the Dugan's drug in downtown Hamilton. Webster had bought the tablets at 4.35 Sunday after the Ocean Stakes. Harvey Miller tells Jones that Mabes got very hoity-toity. Jones finds it odd that Webster's truck was washed clean. But he does find out an interesting bit of information. A state police cruiser was parked in Webster Howard's driveway Monday night. Jones then makes his way down to the funeral for Webster Howard at First Parish Church. He finds out there was an insurance policy for half a million dollars. As he moves past his own house, a colonial on the common, he finds duct tape on his mailbox flag. He opens the envelope under the duct tape. An old style telegram is from Clyde Hooper. Parentheses, M5. He says that new evidence is on the way. Jones shakes his head. He wants to know why O'Connell threw away the R slash L napkin. As he walks along the common to First Parish Church, Jones spots Hooper with a long range lens. People are moving their way into First Parish Church. Jones spots the college president, Nigel Kent, and his housekeeper, Mrs. Johnson. Arnie Dewis's obnoxious voice erupts over the crowd when he asks Jones, Do you know who knocked off Webster? And then he tells Jones that Detective Hooper will solve it. Arnie keeps cackling behind as Jones steers out the pane windows and around to the chandeliers up to the raised white pulpit. He learns from Nigel that the Fletcher's money originated in Great Britain. Mabel Howard is not at her husband's funeral. He's convinced now that O'Connell and Mabel had a relationship and motive for murder. Lark arrives in a bright green blazer. Seated near Jones is L.G. Bentley, the town's lawyer. As he looks up at the tarnished brass pipes, he wonders about Coco and Janet Boudreau. As his father used to say, facts are facts. A simple flag-draped coffin is rolled down the aisle. The Reverend Bricker locks eyes with Jones and then turns away as the congregation sings Amazing Grace. Bricker ascends the pulpit and gives a dramatic eulogy. Jones leans toward Nigel and whispers that Bricker has too much drama. Later, out at the graveyard behind the church, Jones spots Webster's lineage across the gravestones going back hundreds of years. Down at the end of the drive, Coco Stefani stands next to his BMW. Jones walks up the drive and speaks to Coco, where Coco says to him, Jonesy, I owe you an apology. He says that Janet Boudreau was afraid. That's why she's disappeared. Somebody spiked Howard's thermos. They were both in Palm Springs together, and then she was gone. Strickland has already begun looking for her. He invites Jones back to the club later. He tells Coco you really liked her. Coco gets in his beamer and slowly moves away from the church. Jones moves into the crowd buzz of the parish hall. He talks to L.G. Bentley, who gives him a tip. Maybe R.L. is the name for some other place that's now defunct. He sees Hooper run past the windows outside as Arnie and Lark are talked down the end of the hall. Bricker enters the hall and immediately starts arguing with Jones. He talks about the land and Father Gallagher. He is obsessed with the land and keeps referring to First Parish as my church. He throws Jones out. Outside, Hooper and Bucky are standing together and then Arnie. George Strickland pulls up in the cruiser, extricating Jones from more nonsense. Strickland says, we have to go down to Hanson's Marina because the maintenance free has been ripped apart. Strickland moves down Shore Road in the cruiser. Jones is wondering who ripped apart the maintenance free. He thinks about Boudreaux and her horse training. Downhill toward the docks is a plank already extended to the boat. Strickland tells him that his background check on Hooper said that Hooper was a decorated war veteran, successful in intelligence. Jones just can't believe it. Tom McGill is already on the boat. McGill is asking Strickland if there are any drugs on this boat. Jones wonders if O'Connell knew what Webster was up to. At Gallagher's Rectory, Jones meets with First Parish Church's youth group. He keeps thinking about the red paint test being inconclusive. Gallagher alludes to the parish hall argument with Bricker. Bricker takes advantage of camp facilities according to the youth group. Gallagher is very upset just at the mention of Bricker's name. There's a phone call for Jones, it's Coco. They've found R slash L, Racers Lounge, Sagamore, Cape Cod. Five years ago, they changed it to the Pendulum. Jones is leaving for Cape Cod. 
and Coco will drive him down there in his vet in a half an hour. Hoopa's old brown pickup signals for Gallagher's parking lot. Behind him, he has a speaker on his truck, and Bucky is on the channel. He says he has valuable information. Coco arrives in his vet and threatens Hooper. Coco then stands over Bucky and tells him to stay out of the Howard investigation. Jones has never been to Cape Cod. Moonbeams dance at the end of the Cape Cod Canal. At the exit, Jones tells him that Janet Boudreau could have dumped something into the thermos bottle. They drive up into the parking lot of the Pendulum. Jones spots Mabel Howard's car. As bass music blasts into the parking lot, Coco says, so, they're here. They move inside where they make contact with a huge ugly man named Hooch. They're looking for Pete the bartender. On the menu, Jones spots chicken marcella, the meal that was in Webster Howard's stomach, found at the autopsy. An older man in a crew cut named Pete comes out of the back. Jones shows him a newspaper picture of Webster. He says that a tall state trooper was in here asking questions. Someone's running by outside and Jones wonders if it's Hooper. There's another guy with Pete, Maurice Ranch, who threatens Coco and Jones. Coco draws his gun. Coco wants to know who old Connell is tailing. Bucky and Hooper leave through the window. As Coco is threatened by Maurice Ranch, he draws his gun and they head back to the vet. Jones didn't see Mabel's Mercedes. They move along the bridge in the Cape Cod Canal. Coco calls his contact, a member of the mob called Mr. Fiore. He mentions Ranch and Hoop and the grief he experienced at the Pendulum. Fiore says he'll take care of it. As they move over the second bridge over the Cape Cod Canal, a siren sounds and flashing lights light up the bridge. Hooper's old truck is pulling a phony cop routine. The next day, Jones has the red paint scrapings from the maintenance free in a plastic bag on his counter. He's going to bring them to the Fletcher Paint Lab to find out if this paint is sold in the area. His cell phone rings and someone demands a million dollars in cash for Bucky Driscoll, and Strickland laughs. He tells Jones that the racist lounge, the pendulum, was raided and all the people Jones mentioned scattered. He heads to the Fletcher Paint Lab. He will contact Strickland at the station for anything to do with the kidnapping. Coco pulls up and asks Jones if he had a rough night. They head into Fletcher Paint. Hamilton Fletcher is going to put up $1 million for Bucky Driscoll, and Jones has no idea why. He is to meet five miles east of Hanson's Marina at 5 p.m. or Bucky's body will come floating up in the bay. He drops off the paint with Gordon McPhee in the lab, the chief chemist of the Fletcher Paint Company. Hamilton Fletcher exited the elevator. He says that Ham is getting the money. Trooper Pinky Harris and Captain Moxie know about the pickup. Pinky begins questioning him about the cash at 5 p.m. at the marina. Hamilton will personally bring the money down to the marina. Jones keeps saying it's odd that Fletcher is involved. It makes no sense. Jones meets Strickland in front of the captain's house at the marina. Again, he's asking why Fletcher is putting up a million dollars for a security cop. Strickland has learned that Janet Boudreau flew out of Ontario Airport in California. She flew to New York, and then she drove, filling her gas tank four times, ending up in the area. Hamilton Fletcher's bills have been microscopically marked. They move down to the lower docks. Hamilton and his son Ham will stay up in the captain's office to keep Hamilton out of the mix. Strickland says they'll send in a chopper after Jones leaves the money out by the boat. He keeps the radio open. At that time, the obnoxious district attorney, the arrogant, stuffy Herbert Lane walks in. He says this isn't a football game, Jones. Strickland wants Lane up above with Hamilton and his son Ham. Once Jones is out in the bay, Coco thinks he's been conned. Lane is later thrown out of Kendall's house by Hamilton Fletcher. Bots a boat along the river. Jones needs to delay him as long as possible. But there's something else near the flats. A boat with a red rim around it pulls up in the darkness near Jones's boat. There's a distorted voice on an amplified system on the deck of the ship. He hears Bucky's voice inside saying everything is ship shape. Jones calls out for O'Connell, but doesn't get an answer. The distorted voice tells him he'll kill Driscoll if he doesn't get the money. 
and then Hooper shows up out of nowhere, telling the people in the boat to surrender immediately. Jones tells Hooper to veer off. He sideswipes Jones' boat. Someone in a Richard Nixon mask reaches out and grabs the bag of money. Pinky Harris yells at Jones on the microphone for letting the person get away. Strickland issues an arrest warrant for Hooper. Hooper yells out, Clyde Hooper never surrenders. Later, Jones is at his house. Coco hands him a drink. Hamilton Fletcher had flipped out about the whole situation. Strickland picked up Hooper and had him locked up. Hooper will be brought over to Herbert Lane in a brain for obstruction. Jones doesn't think that it's O'Connell who was in the boat, and Bucky somewhere is still held hostage. Jones works with his communications students on the video for the summer send-off at Fletcher Hill. They work editing for several hours as McGill calls. Hooper was released. Someone called from Washington. Gordon McPhee calls Jones. The paint is a Fletcher Marine epoxy sold at Dewar's Lumber. The color is one to red. Jones heads over to Dewar's Lumber's and talks to Bill in the paint department. A lot of people buy this color. Ani shows up with a cigarette pack in his sleeve and almost burns the place down by tossing a cigarette into a pile of sawdust. Bill retrieved a marched invoice, but they can't find anything. Jones asks him to look into April's invoices. Bill finds an invoice from the Christian Youth Group for their camp on the Pequonicut River. Jones then travels north to the camp and checks with a Melanie Willard from the youth group. If he was thinking of Bricker killing Webster Howard, he couldn't come up with a good reason. Melanie tells him the Reverend hasn't been up here often. There's a boat moored in the river, and when Jones looks at the boat, it looks like the boat that he saw in the darkness in the bay with a red rim. Melanie does say the Reverend was up here last week looking for the boat keys. Still, Jones had no motive. Webster had done work for the church, but that was it. He asks about Janet Boudreau. Melanie tells him that she donated riding lessons up at the camp during the summer. She also said that state cops, a big guy, came by here, a trooper O'Connell who was very nervous. Jones now knows that somebody piloted that boat to murder Webster Howard. Why not kill Webster down at the Cape? Why bring him back up here? Jones looks at a connector wire hanging in the lower area of the boat. The whole lower area has been cleaned out. Back at the main hall, the keys are on the hook. But he does notice a public address system in the main hall. And then he thinks of his father's words, never discount anything. There's a black amplifier five feet high. There's a control panel with reverb and modulated equalizers on the side. Jones uses the amp and transforms his voice into the voice that was on the boat. He hears somebody on the mezzanine and funky music. As he opens the door, Bucky Driscoll is sitting in a lounge chair eating ice cream and watching cartoons. He tells Jones that the kidnapper had told him he was in a TV study. Jones asks him, who's behind this? He says, Mr. Big. They've given Bucky $2,000 to eat ice cream and watch cartoons. He said he's cut a deal with Mr. Big. Now he can have cash for he and Arnie's trip to Disney World. Jones calls Strickland and tells him where Bucky is located and also tells him that he's linked up with somebody named Mr. Big but he doesn't have a real name. The state police show up and they bring Bucky over the barracks for five hours. Jones then does some investigating down at the hardware store to find out if any duplicate keys were made for the boat. Strickland calls him and tells him that O'Connell's body has washed up under the Crosstown Bridge. He heads over to Prince William. He's standing with Coco, who is smoking a cigarette under the pillars. He chucks the cigarette into the river and leaves in his beamer. Jones is still confused as to why Bricker would kill Webster Howard. The film for the meeting is almost done. Before he finishes the film, he goes over to the first parish's office and talks to Mrs. Norris, the secretary. As he leaves the office, he runs into Hooper. Hooper tells Jones that Bricker is very vindictive. He came down from Vermont. O'Connell was poisoned with the same cleaner as Webster and the dog, but with a higher dosage. Bricker in the red rim boat demonstrates his guilt. Jones can't believe that Hooper has come up with all this information. Hooper reveals he's a world-class sniper. Jones shakes his head. Now he's wondering if the Reverend may have absconded with church funds. Maybe O'Connell was onto it. Then he asks Hooper, Hooper, who are you? Somehow Hooper has found out too much. Back at Dewey's Lumber, Bill tells him that Bricker has been in many times. 
but never to get a key duplicated. He goes over to Jefferson's Hardware and talks to Courtney Jefferson. He finds out that Janet Boudreaux came in for a key at Jefferson's Hardware and paid cash 10 days ago. But he's wondering if she was the murderer, why she would so easily be seen in public purchasing a key to the boat. Yet Bricker had no motive to kill Webster. It's only when Jones goes to Mosher Abrams' real estate office that he finds out the background on the land purchase. The Reverend had kept changing his mind about selling the land. Webster Howard's father, Nathan, in 1947, sold the land to the church for an inexpensive price. Cooper is sitting on his jeep hood with his clipboard. He tells Jones that Bricker has connections from Manchester Airport to Mexico City. He also has learned that Stephen Baudreau in Southington, Vermont, part of the Ridgeway Group, had made a deal for the land for $850,000. Maybe Bricker had JB make the keys inadvertently and had the brother do the land deal. Both may have been in the dark. At the Fletcher's Estates East Portico, Jones pulls up to see Bricker's PT Cruiser parked along with the other vehicles. He has edited the yearly film with an accusation against Bricker. He moves inside, across the parquet floor, linen tablecloths with water candles burning are spread across the drawing room. Ahead is Hamilton Fletcher's 106-inch TV screen. He has words with Herbert Lane and makes fun of his smoky gray toupee. He inserts his DVD, looks over and says, Showtime. The Reverend is at the head table in a maroon blazer with a flowered print tie. Ricker gives a short speech and then the DVD starts. It's a visual summary of the sports years and a sunlit view of Hamilton College across the bay. Hamilton's marina is shown from above. On the screen is the date of Webster Howard's venture to sea. Bricker raises his brow. The boat is shown and so is the red scrape. Bricker props his elbows on his knee. Jones graphically displays the spreadsheet, the can, and the unit number. And then he shows the invoice of the Christian youth group. On the narration, one of his students says how Webster had left for the pendulum on Cape Cod. He was murdered at sea and Bucky was kidnapped. Money changed hands at the pendulum. A storm graphic showing a storm moving up the eastern seaboard is displayed on the DVD. A small boat out in that area would be taken out to sea with Webster's dead body had it worked out the way the killer wanted. A murdered man would have been swept right off the deck, but Webster struggled to get to the radio and the storm went out to sea. Jones then lists the alleged pilfering of other churches by Bricker. Bricker flees the area. Jones leaps into his car and finds a rattlesnake in his front seat. Arnie Dewis sticks his head in the window. Jones is scared to death of the snake and tells Arnie to get back, and Arnie just lifts the snake out and hurls it onto the shore road. What are you afraid of snakes? Bricker had tried to kill him. Jones goes inside the church. The microphone speaker clicks on and Bricker is on the mic. He's in the choir loft with a rifle. Bricker raises the gun. He fooled Janet Boudreau into going over to the track with the thermos bottle. He sent her to the bridge to make her look real guilty. He has money now to be set for life with Driscoll's ransom. Hooper's voice comes out of the darkness and tells Bricker that he'll be doing his explaining to God Almighty. A shot cracks out at him and Bricker's weapon falls. Bricker flips over the side and lands dead below. And Hooper shouts out, the deed is done. A few weeks later, Gallagher says he had no idea of the extent of Bricker's activities. Janet Boudreau is not around. Coco really liked that girl, says Gallagher. This woman was different, Gallagher said, and Coco melted. Jones and Gallagher head down to the stalls. Arnie and Bucky are actually talking to the horse. Arnie messes up Father Gallagher's name and calls him Father Jerry Donahue. There's a square envelope that Bucky had kept behind the mirror and forgot to give people. It's in a wax seal. When somebody reads this, I will be dead. I will have been punished for what I'm about to do. I'm going to kill Reverend Bricker. My father donated my family's land to First Parish Church. Reverend Bricker stole the proceeds for the land himself. I pleaded with him to give the money back, but he refused. Now he will die at sea. He disrespected my family and he disrespected me. I did not regret my actions. Webster Howard. On a tip from Gallagher, Jones drives out to Observatory Point, Prince William. It's a rendezvous place for lovers and friends. 
Hamilton College is seen in the darkness to the northeast and the Crosstown Bridge and Prince William and the lights ahead. Coco says he likes it up there because nobody bothers you. Club Max's neon is seen near the river in the distance. Life goes on. Where is she? I don't know. Maybe, no maybes, Jonesy. I can't say it doesn't hurt, it does. One thing I told you a long time ago, Jonesy. I may get slammed and the odds may stack up against me, but I always get up. Stretch out the odds.